chills. Number one. So at this point, I'm just looking for help or someone to tell me I'm not losing my mind. My wife went to Atlanta to visit her folks and brought the baby with her. Grandma and grandpa are stoked to have time with the grandson. I get to play Diablo 3 all week and everyone wins. The wife only asked I take care of a few things around the house. Namely, she wanted the bedroom painted. So last night, around 1 o'clock, after several hours of fighting off demons and zombies and other various other minions of hell, I decide to prep for painting before I go to bed. I move the dresser drawers, nightstand, and lamp out of the bedroom and head out to the garage. The garage, by the way, is still a complete mess. I've had the house for four months now and I just never got around to fixing up what the foreclosure process did to that section of the house. I dig through some stuff to get the brushes, paint cans, and trays out. Then I hear it. It was faint at first, but it was definitely coming from the attic. It sounded like crying. I look up and the door to the attic is hanging down ever so slightly. I had been worried about squirrels getting in there since we moved in, so I decided to investigate. The door drops down with a sudden and rather loud slam. My dog gets pissed off, scared by this, and decides to charge into the garage barking. Only, he doesn't make it the whole way. I hear him scamper and howl the whole way from the living room into the laundry room. But when he gets to the doorway between the laundry room and garage, he slams on the brakes. Now this little guy is a Boston Terrier pug mutt that I rescued, so he is by no means a ferocious beast. But I've never seen him scared. He proceeds to piss the floor and shake violently. Benny, what are you doing? I'm not really mad at him, but I probably yelled louder than I should have. He looks up at me with fear in his eyes and keeps messing the floor. I pick him up and take him into the living room, grab a towel and start to wipe up the mess. He slowly and apprehensively follows me back into the laundry room. I walk back into the garage with a hurley, Irish field hockey stick and flashlight. He stayed in the doorway again and whined at me, imploring me not to go up. I don't know what I expected to see, a raccoon, but what I saw froze me in my tracks. I had only made it two steps up the ladder, barely sticking my head into the attic, when I saw her. Clear as day, there was a girl in my attic, no older than six years of age. She sat in the fetal position in the corner of my attic. Her head was buried into her knees, and she rocked herself slowly back and forth. She wore a long t-shirt that I assumed was her pajamas. It looked tattered with age. She was whimpering quietly to herself. I probably wouldn't be able to even discern the sound if not for the fact that I had been stopped dead in my tracks, holding my breath, my heartbeat echoing in my skull. After what seemed like forever, she looked up at me and our eyes met. Her eyes had deep bags as if she had been crying for years without sleep. I'm so hungry. And with that, she was gone. She didn't disappear in a puff of smoke or anything. Just one second there she was, and the next, she wasn't. It was if I was watching a movie and it simply jumped from one frame to the next. I'm not really sure what I saw, but I can only assume it was a ghost. My senses slowly came back to me and I proceeded to tear the hell out of there. Benny and I ran into the bedroom, slammed and locked the door. I sat in my room with all of the lights on for about an hour. I was almost ready to scope out the situation when I heard her start crying again. It was very soft and I don't know how, but I could sense that she was actively trying to cry quietly. It was almost as if she was embarrassed and didn't want to be heard. I'm so hungry reverberated in my head. I could almost hear her say it. It was as if she was talking to me in my head. I didn't feel scared. I got out of bed, Benny decided to continue to hide under the covers, and I went into the kitchen. I made a small bowl of Easy Mac. I poured a glass of milk. I walked into the garage. I flicked on the garage light and was greeted by silence. I already felt foolish, but it seemed even more foolish to leave the food on the floor. So I flipped a hamper upside down and made a makeshift table. 
I left the food on the hamper in the middle of the garage like some sort of preschool offering. I left the garage light on and slowly backed out to the laundry room doorway. I honestly expected to see her tiny, malnourished frame climb down the ladder that I had left open. But after a few minutes, I started to think how ridiculous I was being. I was sleep deprived and overstressed from too much Diablo and work. I could hear Benny crying and immediately felt bad for scaring him so badly. I went back to the bedroom and tried to soothe him, but it turns out I didn't have to. When I got there, he was wagging and seemed like his old self. I can't explain it, but the house felt warmer, less burdened, I don't know. I was gone maybe two minutes, but when I got back to the garage, the food was gone. I mean gone, the bowl was licked clean. I stared at it, dumbfounded, and took the dishes back to the kitchen and put them into the sink. I didn't get much sleep that night. In my dreams, I could see her. She thanked me for the food and asked for cookies, dolls, and chocolate milk instead of regular milk. On the way home from work today, I picked up some Chips Ahoy, more Easy Mac, chocolate syrup, and some cheap Barbie knock-up. I put them in the garage, and when I got back from walking Benny, I returned to a similar scene. Cookies decimated, no crumbs, Easy Mac gone, bowl licked clean, but the doll was missing. I know a lot of these stories ends with a dramatic twist or shocking revelation, but I don't have one for you guys. I don't hear her crying, I don't hear anything from the attic, but I know she's happy. I can't explain how, but I know it down to my bones. I'm equally as sure that she'll talk to me in my dreams again tonight. My concern right now is how I explain to my wife that her family just got a little bigger. Number 2. My wife and I decided to do some spring cleaning this weekend as we do every year around this time. We moved into this home in the late 80s and have engaged in our spring cleaning ritual for the past decade. The house is too small for us now, but my wife wanted to wait until our youngest was off to college before moving. I've learned over the years that arguing with her is pointless when it comes to matters like these, so I have kept quiet and patiently waited for that day to arrive. Paul starts college this fall, so I'm hoping that this will be our last spring cleaning at this house. I have become efficient in this ritual over the years to the point where I have become less of a pack rat during the calendar year. The basement, which used to be the biggest hassle, had little to no clutter this year and was cleared out in only a few hours. The garage was the next area of interest and took the remainder of the evening. My wife's job every year was to clean the attic. She would spend the day locked away in that room and would return around dinner time with a few large bags full of things. I was already curious to where the things came from because I could never recall a time where either of us had ever gone into the attic. I personally hadn't stepped foot in the room upstairs in over a decade. More than usual this year, I said to my wife as she carried the last two things from the attic, it's been a busy year, she smiled, tossing the bags into the last empty bin outside. All done? Almost. Just a bit more, but I can get it done tomorrow. I can. That's okay, she said, kissing my cheek. I can get it. I stared at her with a curiosity that was new to me. This was always such a strange time each year. I remember how frantic she had been when she first brought up spring cleaning. It was strange because if I recall correctly, the house wasn't even that cluttered the first year. She always wanted the attic, which is probably why I've never gone up there. I don't even know what's in the attic. I decided I was going to go look, but I couldn't do it while my wife was home. She was always so protective over the attic. The next morning, she said she needed to run to the store. I kissed her goodbye and read my newspaper at the breakfast table. I watched her walk out to the car and pull away. Once I was sure she was out of sight, I put down my paper and rushed to the attic entrance. My heart pounded as I pulled the attic stairs down to me. I felt dirty spying on my wife's attic, but part of me felt scared. We were so honest with each other in our relationship, this attic seemed to be the only secret. I have no idea why I never checked before today. I stepped onto the first stair of the ladder and the cold air from the Arctic rushed over my face. Cold air? From the attic? 
My pulse quickened as I climbed the ladder. A low rumbling sound filled my ears as I neared the opening to the attic. My eyes peeked into the room and opened in confusion. The floor was a bright white laminate, and the room was surrounded with fans. The fans were attached to large coolers which seemed to be connected by piping. I walked to one of the coolers and opened it with a reluctant pull. The container was full of ice water. That explains the cold air. I assumed that each of the coolers was filled with the same, and the pipes ran the water to each from the main line. A metal table sat in the center of the room near a boarded up window. My chest felt like it would cave in on itself. My breath circled my face in pillows of vapor. What is going on up here? A small metal case sat in the corner on top of a metal stand with wheels. To the right of the case sat a box of latex gloves. I opened the case and swallowed the lump that formed in my throat. Sharp objects lined the inside of the case. It reminded me of a surgery kit. Every instrument was spotless and shining. I looked around the room and noticed that everything was polished. My mind ran with images of what this room could be used for, and they all starred my wife and a dead body. I pictured her with a mask over her face cutting into a young girl as she cried for her mother. My wife, carrying bags of severed limbs to the garage, after storing them up in our attic for months at a time. There must be a better explanation for this. My eyes searched the floor and noticed drains under each cooler for the first time. I crawled on the ground and peered inside the drain unsure what I would find. I used the light from my phone to light up the inside of the dark drain and gasped at the sight. Blood. I heard a car door slam and leapt to my feet. I rushed to the attic entrance and almost fell through the opening. Keys rattled against the door as I secured the attic door above me and ran to the kitchen. I was putting my plate in the sink as my wife entered the room. You all right? she asked. Yeah, I said, breathing heavily. Why? Looks like you've been running, she laughed. She walked over to me and gave me a hug. Her eyes narrowed as she pulled away. You're freezing. She knows. I had to think fast. I must be getting sick. I said, attempting to give her my best sick face. You do look a bit pale, she frowned. Yeah, I just found out that my wife is a serial killer. I'm just gonna go lay down. You do that, she said. I'll finish cleaning the attic. The words made me shiver. What did she need to finish exactly? The room was spotless. Okay. I lay on the bed and closed my eyes. Visions of victims screaming while my wife cut into them like lab specimen filled my dreams. Blood poured from the wounds she inflicted as the screams deafened me. I watched as my children took the place of the victims. One by one, my wife murdered our children until it was finally my turn on the table. I woke in a cold sweat with my wife staring at me from our bedroom doorway. Her eyes were cold and menacing. Honey, I asked nervously. You went to the attic. No, I... I thought I told you to stay out of the attic, she cried. Her reaction wasn't what I expected. She seemed sad, but I expected anger. What is going on? I can't let you leave, she sobbed as she pulled a syringe from behind her back. I'm sorry. She lunged at me onto the bed. The needle pierced my thigh, but I was able to use her momentum to toss her off the other side. Blood trickled down my leg as I ran to the front door. I heard a gunshot ring out as I turned the corner to the living room. Tears rolled from my cheeks as I sped out the front door as a second shot nicked the frame. I ran across the yard, waiting for the next shot to take me out, but it never came. I disappeared in the trees behind our neighbor's house, and only when I was out of sight did I look back. My wife sat crouched down on her front doorstep with my gun in her hand crying. The police arrested my wife, and I watched them carry the coolers out of the attic for evidence. They found pieces of a young boy who was reported missing a few weeks prior. I looked into my wife's eyes and I couldn't recognize her. She looked at me with regret. A fear in her eyes swelled into tears as the car pulled away. I woke up the next morning and turned on the television. Every news station was playing the same story. My wife, the serial killer. I felt dirty in my own home. 
How could many people meet their end in my attic? The police were already estimating that it could be in the dozens. The thought made me nauseous. I grabbed the box of cereal from the cupboard and poured myself a bowl as I watched the footage. The pundits were discussing how I could have possibly not known about these things occurring in my own house. I thought the same thing. I grabbed the milk from the fridge and opened it. I glanced down to the bowl and stopped as the first drop hit the paper that sat in my cereal. I grabbed the note and unfolded the paper. My heart pounding in my neck as I read the words, It's Paul you should be afraid of. Number 3 When we first moved into our new home, about 14 years ago, we all felt really comfortable. It was a really nice house, with a basement and attic, three bedrooms, three baths, and plenty of rooms for offices, entertainment centers, etc. Perfect because we had just had an addition to our family three years prior, my babysitter Abigail. And for you listeners with multiple children, you know just as well as I do that a family with kids needs a lot of room. We made use of every room in the house, except for the attic. The attic was just a simple attic. We never went up there. I remember the only time I ever really saw up there was just a few feet surrounding the open hatch. Well, my dad was on the ladder with a flashlight. The only thing out of the ordinary was that the rest of it was shrouded in, an almost unnatural darkness. I didn't pay attention to it. I was seven years old. I didn't understand the significance of the darkness, nor associate anything with it except a passing thought of, man, it sure does look scary up there. Anyway, the house was beautiful but unusually noisy. You know, those cliché bump-in-the-night noises the house makes. And you get scared and your parents tell you that it's just the house settling. Those kind of noises, except a lot of them. We paid it no attention and for years, we dealt with it and eventually grew used to it. Just your normal happy family living in a somewhat creepy home. 14 years passed and now we're at the present day, as of last week. I moved out about a year ago and now I'm in a relatively decent apartment and attending college. My parents has recently told me that they plan on selling the house. They asked me to write up a summary about the house's details, history, accompanying property, etc. Of all the years I lived in that house, none of us really cared for the history and the agent who sold us the house never really mentioned it. We were too awestruck by the great deal, so out of a newfound curiosity, I started researching the property. It seemed relatively normal. One odd thing is, however, the previous owner's husband had disappeared, and after authorities searched for him for months, he was presumed dead. The wife and her teenage daughter were distraught, and could no longer stay in the house where they once lived together as a family. That's when they moved out and we moved in. I decided that, after I finished the write-up, I would research the previous owners just a little bit more. After about three hours, I finished up what I thought was a quality summary and emailed it to mom and dad. Then I decided to do a little research on my own. You heard the previous owner's story. But the previous previous owner's story and the previous 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 owner's story I found to be a little more fruitful and frightening. The property was originally a farm, settled on around 1895. The farm was expansive and successful. The family owned the farm for many years, until around 1934, during the Great Depression. In order to keep a steady stream of income, the farmer who owned the land leased and sold most of his property. Funny thing is, the people who would buy the property or use it always either ended up dead or missing, under mysterious circumstances every time. No witnesses would be present, as everyone on site would be either dead or as previously stated, missing. I started turning to the farmer's daughter, Maggie. Maggie had grown up on the property and thought of selling the property was the most awful thing she could think of. Unable to face the harsh reality of the severe depression, she was the only one of the family that protested selling or leasing any of the land, and that was made very clear to buyers. Police interviewed her parents, all of whom had said she had been acting very strange, isolating herself to her room for long hours, skipping out on meals, you know, typical teenage rebellion thing. 
Turns out, upon reviewing the evidence and searching Maggie's room, they found several items associated with old-timey black magic. Unable to make an arrest for witchcraft, the police had no further evidence that she was guilty of or associated with the murders of the property buyers and leaseholders. The family sold the farm in 1950. Maggie had long since passed away. The house came under new ownership and the house was completely remodeled. By this time, only five of the original 300 acres remained with the main house. The main house is the house that my family ended up in. In 1951, the owners of the house, including their 7 and 10 year old children, were reported missing. Police documents stated that, upon entry, the house smelled of rotten eggs, blood and smoke, the sources of which could not be found in the lower levels of the house or the basement. Upon performing a thorough search of the house, the last place left was the attic. Here the bodies of the entire family were found, including the children. They had been mutilated beyond recognition, so badly that the images were not released for public viewing. No suspect was found, and no witnesses were present. The murder remains unsolved to this day. Needless to say, the house was put back up on the market and resold multiple times. The owners up until their family had all experienced strange noises and moved out fairly quickly. One year, two or three years the longest, besides our family having stayed for five years. All of these residents had no odd experiences other than the strange noises or the sense of being watched. Then the previous owner's husband went missing. I got curious as to what the attic looked like today. I returned home to visit for the weekend. And while my parents were out grocery shopping, I told my sister, now 17, about the history I had found. You know I'm all about this creepy shit, she said, and we have to go to the attic. Although I was tempted to convince her otherwise, I was too curious to deny her request. We went upstairs in the attic. What we found is why there was next a Roman cohort's worth of authorities parked in my yard. All these years we had never looked in that attic, and apparently... Neither had police when they were in search of the previous owner's husband. That's where we found him. There was the body. It was just bones by this time. And the forensics team told us that they were surprised we didn't notice the smell during the initial stages of decay when we first moved in. I was surprised too, because upon entering the attic, we were greeted with a rather awful stench. As the two who originally discovered the bodies and with me being a criminal justice major with heavy ties to our local PD, they allowed my sister and I to see the official report and evidence gathered. According to official reports, the victim had suffered blunt trauma prior to the murder. She had knocked him out. There were, upon closer examination, bloodstains leading to the ladder of the attic. She had drug him up to the attic all by herself. Near the body were candles, bowls filled with strange ingredients, and other strange books and artifacts. Autopsy revealed that the victim had suffered severe lacterations to all of his limbs, as well as his face and genitalia. The bowls were printed, and no prints were able to be lifted. The victim was tested, and he was confirmed to be the previous owner's husband, as everyone very well knew already. The previous owner was now a prime suspect, but no one could contact her. The murder had taken place close to 15 years ago. Her whereabouts, her condition, and her intentions were and are still unknown. I was dumbfounded that we had been living in a house with a dead guy just upstairs, and we never knew. I got curious yesterday and researched the previous owner. Eventually, I found her in images, a newspaper when a newspaper from when the case was still hot. When I saw her face, my jaw dropped. Remember all of the research I did on the house's history? Well, images of all of the owners were included in that search, including one of Maggie when she was about 20 years old. The picture was dated 1941. Maggie, who was supposed to have passed away in an automobile accident in 1947. Maggie, whose face I was now staring at on my computer screen. Why did she do it? Was she making a sacrifice or something? I know it was her. There was no denying it. I know she killed the other owners as well, 
or used her dark magic or something to harass them out of the house. She was a witch. How could she live to be that old but look so young? Was she still killing owners of her old property? What kind of supernatural help had she enlisted to aid her in her killing spree? And most importantly, where is she now? Number 4. First things first, this is my first time ever visiting this website. I never even knew it existed before this morning. I was directed to this forum by a friend of mine who said this would be a perfect place to share my story. It's a story about a box that I found in my attic. A little backstory about my home, built in 1954, having one previous owner. It sits basically in the middle of nowhere, in a quiet town of about a hundred people. The closest property to me is approximately one mile away. I bought this house because I wanted to get away from all the big city madness that I had been living in for the past 35 years. I've lived in the house for roughly three years now, just me and my dog. I live quite the lonely life, but I'm fine this way. I wouldn't have it any other. So the other day, I was up in my attic fetching some summer patio furniture that I had up there. It's a pretty creepy space, no lights, very tight and narrow, and basically a hot box. I do not like being up there one bit, just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I got my furniture out of there as quick as possible and scurried on out of there. But not before I tripped over something on my way out. It was a box. I have never seen this box before. It was this rusty old metal box that it was locked shut with a padlock. It was not anything of mine that I had owned or put up there. Kinda baffled me. But I figure maybe it was something left behind by a previous owner that I had never seen before. I take the box outside and decide to attempt to pry it open. It was pretty heavy. I shook it a couple of times and it just felt like a brick in there. I took a saw to the lock and finally got it open after about 10 minutes. Inside the box, it was literally just a brick, but attached to the brick was a letter which read the following, Hello there friend, you found my brick. It doesn't belong to you though, so put it back where you found it. I just kind of laughed for a minute and thought that's kind of weird. I didn't put it back though. I actually threw it outside behind my garage and scrapped the box. Fast forward to later that evening. I was sitting in my living room when all of a sudden I hear a loud crash in the kitchen. I go over to check it out, frightened as hell, and see that my kitchen window had been smashed. Shards of glass all over the floor and a brick laying there. It had a note attached to it and it said, This is what happens when you don't put things back where they belong. Get the fuck out. I'm totally freaking out at this point. I never even told a single person about the brick I found in my attic. What the... How the... I had no explanation. Mind boggling. I went outside to see if there was anyone around, but it was literally dead silence. As I live in the middle of nowhere, no footsteps, car engines, anything. Meanwhile, my dog is back in the house, barking at the stairs that go up to the attic. What the fuck? I'm really bugging. Do I dare go up there? It's creepy enough as it is. Don't know what to do, so I call a buddy of mine over. Waited outside till he got there and we both go up there together. We both have our flashlights and are peeking around to see if we can see anything, when all of a sudden I see a note tacked to the wall that said, put my brick back. So freaking paranoid. I stayed at my buddy's house for the weekend and planned to go back in the morning. Number five. When I was younger, just on the cusp of being, number five, when I was younger, just on the cusp of being a teenager, my sister and I were in the attic. We were hunting for some old toys we had stored up there that we wanted to pull out and give a run for their money. It was a simply designed attic, old floorboards, steep old roof, everything bare to the eye. That's why it was so bizarre when we noticed the small cubby door on one of the walls, logically leading to what would have been the outside of the building. Being the curious creatures we were, we just had to open it. The long and narrow crawl space we discovered defied imagination. How was it possible for it to be there? It violated everything our young minds knew about space and architecture. 
And so I ran off to get my dad while my sister stayed and watched it just to make sure it did not disappear while I was away. When I came back with him, he was just as stunned as we were with the discovery. After pondering it for a short while, we all knew there was really not any choice. We had to know what was in there. Getting down on our hands and knees, we went inside to investigate the seeming impossibility. We found more attic, the same decor, just more walls, and a much, much larger space filled with shelves and storage containers. It was utterly fascinating that it was filled with all manners of things, art, tools, appliances. We wondered how it had all gotten there. Some of it could have not even been physically brought in unless it had been built from scratch in that space, or the building was erected around it, such as a matching washer and dryer. But even stranger yet was that my father began to recognize the things stored there, things he had lost, things he had thrown away over the years, renewed and in prime condition. These were his things from the years of his life. It was amazing. We vowed to come back in the morning and remove everything we could because there was so much history, nostalgia, and genuinely useful objects held there. The next day came, and for some reason, we all seemed just far too busy to go back. It will be there tomorrow, we all said. And the next day, and the day after that, we barely even thought about it, as it slipped away from our minds like a fog. Before too long, only a few weeks out, I was convinced I had dreamed the entire thing, and no one spoke on it anymore. I did not even bother looking in the attic. That was how far removed from reality the idea was. Time passed, and my sister and I grew into our 20s. We both moved away, and she had kids of her own, both of us married. Unfortunately, tragedy struck, and my father fell ill. We both had to return to care for him and prepare his estate for the inevitable conclusion of his terminal disease. It probably comes as no surprise that this put us both in the attic again. Mainly, things needed to be organized and removed. And it probably comes as no surprise that when we were there, we stumbled across the same cubby door we had seen more than a decade prior. And in that instant, we looked at each other and remembered. We could see it in each other's eyes. We had both forgotten for no reason. We were determined to not let it go to waste again. I told my sister I was going to go get some boxes so we could start moving things out, and she agreed to go inside and start gathering what she could to bring out. I had just left the attic when my phone rang. Answering it, my mother came on from the other side in hysterics. My father had just passed away. I went back to get my sister after hanging up, no longer concerned with pilfering the strange room, numb from shock, except the door was gone. I stared at the wall where it had been, feeling the terror of betrayal. I began to scream and yell hysterically for my sister, but there was no answer. I clawed at the wall and took a hammer to it, only to eventually break through to the aluminum siding of the house, creating a hole I would later have to patch to sell the building. I had no idea what to do. I did not even think I could realistically call the police. I had no idea what to tell them. Eventually, I gathered myself up and went to the hospital to be with the rest of my family, expecting them to ask where my sister was. They never did, not even her husband, ever. A few years have passed since then. Every once in a while, I see pictures of my sister around my house, and I remember that once upon a time, she existed. Sometimes I think I made her up, or that I'm misremembering a stranger's face in those old photos. No one ever came looking for her. No police, not her job. No one acknowledged she was missing. When I asked my mother, she would stare blankly at me, and after some prodding, slowly nod. She remembered, yes, I had a sister, and that was as interested as she got. My sister's husband gave me much the same reaction. He would ask me who I was talking about when I mentioned her name. Eventually, he would concede that he seemed to recall being married at some point, and his lack of conviction would make me think I made it all up. I probably did. Either way, he has a new girlfriend and his children are calling her mom. They have never missed a beat, but
but sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night because I hear someone walking in my attic. I hear a voice I think I recognize, but I can't place who it belongs to anymore. She asks for me to help her, but I don't even know why I would be helping her or what I'm helping her do. Either way, she's in the attic, and there's nothing in my attic, so it must be my imagination. I just wish I could stop hearing her voice after I wake up. Thanks for checking out this video. Please consider subscribing because we upload a new scary countdown every week. My name is Chills and my Twitter is at YTChills and my Instagram is at DylanIsChillinYT. I'd really appreciate a follow and feel free to send me a DM if you have any comments or suggestions. See ya.